No. Okay, today we're gonna <clears throat> we're gonna um, change topics. We're gonna talk about language today, um, and hopefully this will be. Hopefully we can bring it back to our robot question from the beginning of the semester. So do you guys remember the robot question? Yep. So what is the robot question? <clears throat> right, how to make their heads explode. Or, you know, but yeah, that's one way to, make, to, to answer that robot question. So how do, you, how do you design a robot that acts like a human, right? So how can you get an android and pass it off as human? So one of the things that you need it to do is to be able to talk to people, right? And to communicate like a human does. So anybody have an iPhone 4S with Siri? I do. OK. So does Siri always understand you? How good is Siri? Not very good. Not very good. Diane, what, what sort of problems do you have with Siri? Like she just understands some wrong. And she can't do anything. She's like great. <laughs> <laughs> so she can take text and translate it to speech? Yeah. Okay, so that's not that hard. We've been able to do that for a good long time, right? So yeah. um, Stephen Hawking's little text mm -hmm. translator thing does that pretty well, and that's he's had that for like 20 years. In fact, so does everybody know who Stephen Hawking is? Phys astrophysicist, um, wheelchair-bound, has ALS. Um, and he's got this little voice transcriber thing. So he painstakingly, either he types out or he has somebody else type out, his his speeches, and then he has this little voice thing that, that trans, translates, basically, from text to speech. And it has a very distinctive sound, right? So he's been a character on The Simpsons, and you know it's him because you can recognize his little voice thing. But they don't make it anymore. Nobody makes it anymore. So he's had to hire a guy to create a voice synthesizer that sounds exactly like his thing. So that you know, as the thing falls apart, that, that they can they can reproduce this this very distinctive text or this very distinctive speech. So Siri is not that great, right? So that's sort of where we are right now. So why is Siri not that great? What sort of things does Siri fall down on? Or in other words, what makes it hard to understand a language? Why do computers have a hard time with it? Dana. Well, you have to say things like exactly the way that she's programmed to understand it. Okay. Just talk okay. So, do you have any example of that? Can you think of an example of that? So, if you were talking to a person and you wanted, you know, um, you wanted to figure out where to go for lunch, how about that? So, this is the perennial question: Where should we go for lunch? You could ask Siri, where should we go for lunch? And what would Siri say? She'd probably look up the definition of lunch or something like that. Should we try it? One thing, if you asked her where to go for lunch, she'd give you 10 restaurants within a few miles. But that's because she's specifically programmed to it. Okay. Most of the time, she has a problem blending two similar words into some non-existent word. OK. And so she doesn't understand what that is. So she'll try to Google it, but Google doesn't do makeup works very well either. <laughs> and so it's end of story. So okay, so so there's sort of several levels of problems here. And we're actually going to talk about a bunch of these things. So first we're going to talk about what makes a language. So what counts as language? It's pretty clear that English counts as a language, and that's what Siri is shooting for is trying to understand English. Um, but then you've got the problem of um, sort of the ambiguities. So Siri has difficulty here at the very beginning with understanding phonemes. So the difference between lunch and launch, for example. So you all understand that distinction, lunch and launch. <coughs> Completely different things, right? So where should we go for lunch versus where should we go for launch? Um, one you're going to end up in orbit, the other one you're going to end up with you know, a burrito or something. So Siri has difficulty with these things, right? So this is a problem. Um, and we'll talk about sort of how do, how do we go about solving this problem. And maybe that'll give us some insight into building a better Siri. Um, words have problems. We have, so once we understand the sounds that make up the words, do we understand the words themselves? Do we understand sentences? Do we understand text? So sort of starting really small and then going bigger and bigger to, um, to more complicated utterances. All right, so the, it turns out there are between six and 7,000 different languages in the world. 
uh, many with several dialects. And the difference between a language and a dialect is that dialects are mutually intelligible, whereas languages are not. Um, dialects differ in, from one another in grammar and vocabulary. It's usually associated with either socioeconomic status or location. So different parts of the country, for example, will have different dialects. And then accents are the same dialect, just with differences in pronunciation. So you just pronounce the phonemes differently. The sounds are, are different. Turns out the languages are disappearing at a pretty rapid clip. Uh, more than half of the languages, so more than half of that six to 7,000 are spoken by fewer than 10,000 people. So that's less than the undergraduate population here. Um, some people estimate that maybe 90% of the languages spoken on the earth right now will be gone within 100 years. And people drop languages for all sorts of reasons, uh, mostly for assimilation and to use the language of commerce. So right now, what is the language of commerce? English, yeah, lucky for you. Um, it's English, so you don't have to learn another language. Um, what do you call somebody who speaks three languages? Trilingual. Two languages? Bilingual. One language? American. Haha. -ha. Um, so technically, there are seven characteristics that define a language that, that sort of if you think that you have a language, it's got to meet these seven characteristics in order to, um, to count as a language. So first, it's got to be communicative. You got, it has to be able to express ideas um, and permit communication between two different individuals. Um, it has to have semanticity, so it has to stand for something other than itself. So an example of something that, that has no semanticity would be like a grunt or ouch. Does ouch count? No, I think ouch counts, because ouch is different in different languages. But like a grunt or a scream or something like that, that's just the thing itself, right? It doesn't stand for something else. Um, the mapping between the sound and the reference, what, it, what it's talking about is arbitrary. So you could say one, you could say uno, you could say ed, you could say eins. So all of these things are arbitrary, but they all refer to the same concept, right? So there's an arbitrary mapping between the sound and, and and the reference. Is there? Is between the same thing what? Between semanticity and arbitrariness? It's like saying so buzz doesn't count because it's just the sound. Animals make different sounds in different languages. Yeah, but you, can, you know that if a cat's saying meow, you still know what it is. <laughs> yeah, but if a French person is telling you what, what sound a cat's making, you have no idea what it is. Yeah, pigs in Hungarian say roof, roof. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. <coughs> no, it, it, they are slightly different, though. So the semanticity just means that it, it, it means something different. Um, but, and the arbitrariness is related, but it, it's slightly different. It means that there's no real formal mapping onto, onto what, it, what it refers to, that different languages have different mappings. Semanticity says that there is a mapping. Arbitrariness says that there are different mappings. Um, they're structured, so meaning they have a grammar, basically. Um, the, pattern of symbols, the pattern of symbols is not arbitrary. Um, they're generative, meaning that you can come up with new utterances, new sayings, and they're dynamic. They change. And usually languages change about, they roll over about every six, seven hundred years or so. So, and this is particularly if you don't have really a writing system. So the language of the Bible, we don't really talk like that anymore. So the King James Bible, so that was translated what? Five, six hundred years ago? So that's sort of Middle English. If you go all the way to Old English, that's a completely different language than what we speak today. So language actually evolves over time. Um, and they sort of die out that way. And they don't necessarily die out, die out. It's not like Latin is completely dead, because Latin lives on in things like Spanish, and Portuguese, and Italian, and Romanian, all of these Latin derivatives, but nobody really speaks Latin anymore. So these are all the, the sort of um, technical characteristics of language, but we can talk more generally as to what we're going to define as language. So these are, this actually comes from your book. Um, so Kellogg has, um, has come up with these, which is basically distilling down the seven into, into these basic four. 
So all languages share these four characteristics. First, kids learn them, um, or ki children can learn them. <clears throat> Second, adults can speak them and understand each other re readily, so that's the communicative bit. They capture the ideas that people normally communicate, and they enable communication among groups of people in a social and, and cultural context. So, using these criteria, say I'm an uber geek, which is not that big of a stretch, and I have learned Navi, the language of the Navi from um, Avatar, and this is an actual language, you can look it up um, online, you can get you know, Navi in a nutshell, there might even be a Navi for dummies book. So, does this count as a language? I go to my Comic-Con convention dressed up as one of these blue people, and I see somebody else dressed up as one of these blue people, and I start chatting away in Navi, are we using a language? Okay. Sarah is a little bit hesitant. You don't have to have, I mean, I know you have a sort of cultural context, you can't really make it from your words. I mean, you could, but no. So it doesn't count. Okay. So Zara says, it doesn't count because if you need new words, what are you going to do? You, well, you could import them from English, um, which is pretty likely, and you know, it happens all the time. So if you, you know, speak any, any other language and you think about what, are the, what do we call computers in that language, or what are computer terms in every other language, well, they're English terms, right? So as we invent new things, we sort of take on the, the we import other, other words. So that could happen in Navi, but that's, that can't be the bulk of your language, otherwise it's just a dialect of English, right? So Sarah says no. What about you guys who said yes? Why? Are you teaching it to your children? <laughs> <laughs> that would rocket me into like the stratosphere of uber geekiness, right? <laughs> Um, no, I'm not teaching it to my kids. So, yeah, children don't typically readily learn this. What languages do children learn? Right, yeah, the language of the environment, right? So the language that's sort of present, whatever is spoken in the home, um, or spoken at school, or, or, or whatever they're exposed to. Kids probably aren't getting a lot of exposure to Navi unless mom and dad are, are that geeky. And so, and then they're going to go out in, you know, they're going to get into kindergarten and they're going to go, what the what? People don't speak like this. Um, and then they'll realize that nobody but mom and dad speaks like this. And that will be a huge disappointment, right? So Navi may be kind of sort of, right? So if, it, if other people speak it, then it allows communication. If your kids are going to pick it up, then yeah, maybe, but that's highly unlikely, right? Plus, there's the whole social context. Do you act, are you actually able to talk about things in Navi that normal people talk about? Well, first, if you're talking Navi, you're not a normal person by definition. Um, and second, I was, well, I was thinking about apologizing to anybody who does speak Navi, but I don't think I, I'm in any danger of that, right? Um, se second... <laughs> where was I going with that? I don't remember where I was going with that. All right, so normal people, don't, oh, and then you, the, what Sarah said, you lack the, the sort of vocabulary, right? So in fact, um, the guy who made up Navi for the movie, he was a linguist at, I think, UCLA, one of the universities in LA, and they would change lines in the, in the dialogue, in the script, and then they'd say, okay, how do you say this? And he's like, there's no word for that in Navi, so he would have to make up new words for things in Navi. So there's, there's just not a big enough vocabulary in Navi to, to, to encompass you know, what people normally talk about in social contexts. It doesn't allow for this sort of communication. Klingon is more developed, so Klingon counts. <laughs> Navi, not so much. Sorry? So uh, for our purposes, uh, how are we counting math, music, or computer language? Um, we're ignoring them for our purposes. <laughs> so, like, um, when you say computer languages, are you talking about, like, C or, and yeah. stuff like that? Um, yeah. Yeah, no, we're, 
we're going to say that those are not necessarily languages because they don't allow you to. So if we go back to these criteria here, they don't allow you to sort of talk about things outside of those very specific realms, right? So with a computer language, you can tell your computer what a password is and things like that, what counts as a password. But beyond that, you can't tell it what counts as, you know, love or stuff like that. So that it doesn't allow you to talk about things outside of that very circumscribed um, situation. All right, so pretty generally, um, we're going to introduce semantics and syntax, and then we're, we're going to come back to these in a little bit. So semantics is a study of meaning. So it's what, what do the words actually mean? Or in other words, how do people mentally represent the meanings of words and sentences? And we've talked about this a little bit, where we were talking about um, semantic memory. Um, and sort of how do you actually represent the idea, the sentence of the, the three turtles rest on a log and a swim, and a fish swims underneath it. Um, related to this is morphemes, which is the smallest unit of speech used to code a specific meaning. So you can think of it as words, but it's, it's sometimes smaller than words. It's also word parts. So, like, if you need to make something plural in English, what do you do? Sig an S on the end, right? So that S, that plural S is a morpheme. That means something, right? It means that it's plural. Whatever you've attached it to has now become plural. So you've got the meaning of book plus the S on the end, books, that's two morphemes, right? So you have the book and then you have the pluralization of that. So the way that this works. So we're sort of here in the middle level talking about morphemes. Phonemes are the individual speech sounds that are meaningful in, in your language. Um, and we'll talk about phonemes here in just a second. Morphemes are sort of as you build up from those things. So they're analogous to, so phonemes are analogous to letters, morphemes are analogous to words, but realize that there are morphemes that are smaller than words, they're word parts. And then they get, gain access to this mental lexicon, this mental dictionary that you're carrying around that has meanings, that assigns meanings to all of these things, to these speech utterances. So like I said, we'll come back to semantics and we'll talk about it a little bit more. I just want to introduce the idea right now. And then I also want to introduce the idea of syntax. So syntax is the grammatical rules that specify how words go together. So what counts as a, a meaningful grammatical utterance in your language? And what counts as sort of Yoda speak, right? Kind of intelligible, but not necessarily, not really. So we'll come back, we'll come back to talk about syntax when we talk about sentences in a minute. But I want to give you an example of where speech perception falls apart. <laughs> No one can to get to see me. No young clist to show my live. When I get a Joseph at the end of the tomorrow, you want us to die, Molinai, your sort of show. Yes, he I think it's Romanian. Does anybody speak Romanian? Yeah, it's Romanian. <laughs> Nobody's going to correct me. Um, yeah, so where did she go wrong? <laughs> I feel so bad laughing about that, but it's, it's funny. It's genuinely funny. What's the German word for Latin? Schadenfreude. 
We'll talk about schadenfreude quite a bit, a little bit later on. <laughs> Actually, this week, later this week. Um, yeah, so schadenfreude is the idea that um, laughing or gaining pleasure from another person's misfortune. So this is just chock full of schadenfreude. Right? <laughs> it's like laughing at you, laughing with you. Yeah, so this is, that's laughing at you, schadenfreude is. So um, America's Funniest Home Videos completely built on schadenfreude, right? So you're laughing at everybody as they're getting, you know, hit in the crotch, things like that. Um, it wouldn't exist without it. My, my kids love this. So this is streaming on Netflix now, America's Funniest Videos, is that what it's called, AFB? And uh, even my 18-month-old thinks it's hilarious, especially when there are dogs involved. Those dogs are cute. All right, so where did she go wrong? Did she get any of the phonemes right? Not really, kind of, sort of, um, and it may have to do with, you know, Mariah Carey not really enunciating very well. Uh, so you sort of need to have the context, right? It helps if you speak the language to understand the words. So the words to Feliz Navidad, I've got no idea what it says, but I sing it all the time. <laughs> and I probably sound exactly like this, right? Or the Bamba. I've, I've got all the words memorized for the Bamba, but it's sort of my Ken Lee version of the Bamba. So you've got to be able to fit it in context, right? So it helps if you speak the language. So first, in order to speak the language, you've got to know the phoneme. So it turns out English has about 36... Yeah, let's say about three dozen phonemes um, that correspond to vowel sounds. We've got loads of vowel sounds, and then um, we're fairly limited in our, in our consonant sounds. So the consonant sounds basically match up to our letters. So you've got B's, D's, F, G, etc., etc. You've got some funny ones like the ing, the, the ing and sing, and finger, um, which if you're from St. George, you pronounce funny. You actually pronounce it like this if you're from St. George. Anybody from St. George? Not that you're going to admit to it now, because you know I'll make fun of you. All right, so pay attention, though, if you have friends from St. George. Ask them to, you know, what kind of golf clubs they have, and they'll say that they have peens instead of pings. All right, so what's the difference between peen and ping? Say ping, say ping. So does everybody... Yeah, how the, how the tongue connects with the top of your mouth, right? So with peen, it's farther forward. With ping, with the ing sound, it's farther back toward, um, toward the back of your mouth. So this is basically how we di differentiate between different phonemes. So there are phonemes that are present in English that are not present in other languages. For example, like the th sound, uh, both the hard and the soft th. Um, not really present in a lot of other languages. And so this is, this is basically how we identify speakers of other languages, right? So other languages have different phonemes, and in order to speak without an accent, you have to adopt the correct phonemes. In order to pretend that you do have an accent, you just drop the phonemes, and you adopt phonemes from other languages. So if you want to sound French, for example, well, then you get rid of this, for example, and it's a Z sound instead of a TH sound, right? Um, what else do you do with French? Oh, drop the H's, because there's no H in French. And then R's are weird in French. That's all I can say. <coughs> I can't do them. My daughter's doing French immersion right now, and she just laughs at me. Oh, Dad, you don't say thank you like that. Uh, anything else I want to say about phonemes? Yes, lots I want to say about phonemes, but not here. All right, so why is phoneme perception hard? Well, it turns out that we produce phonemes very, very quickly. About 50 per second. Plus, there's also um, this problem of variability in phoneme production. So different speakers produce phonemes differently. Um, speakers differ in pitch, accent, speed in speaking, and pronunciation. And the acoustic signal must be transformed from sort of this continuous speech stream into familiar words. So you've got to go from something that sounds like Ken Lee into can't live, even though the speech stream may look something like this. So this is a speech spectrogram. So it's got the frequency on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. 
So the frequency is just what what sounds are present in the in this in the speech sound. So lower frequencies are going to be your vowels. So these these big bands here indicate high power in these lower frequencies, and then your consonants are going to going to show up in the higher frequencies. So you could have somebody enunciating nicely, and you have nice separation. So where there's nothing going on here, that means there's silence in between the words. So you can say, "What are you doing?" You can sort of see the diphthong and doing, doing, right, it goes up at the end. Or you could say, what are you doing? Or what are you doing? So we, you understand both of those utterances, right? What are you doing versus what are you doing? Both of those are intelligible, although the one is all sort of smashed together. There's no real segregation between the speech sounds. So when you go to a foreign country where you don't speak the language, how does that language sound to you? Does it sound like this or like that? The bottom one, right, exactly. There is no real segregation. When I got to Hungary, after, you know, straight out of the MTC, right into Hungary, I was so mad at my MTC teachers because they didn't teach me that language. They taught me this. And then I get to Hungary and the, the, the assistants to the president take me out street contacting, because they thought that was really funny to take new greenies out to talk to people in the middle of the street, and you're just going, what, are you, what is this? I knew how to ask where the bathroom was, but I couldn't understand a single person. All right, so this is one of the problems. There's also this. Let's see if these work. All right, see if you can identify where these speakers are from. Please call Stella. Ask her to bring those things with her from the store. Six spoons of fresh snow peas, five thick slabs of blue cheese, and maybe a snack for her brother Bob. We also need a small plastic snake and a big toy frog for the kids. She can scoop these things into three red bags, and we will go meet her Wednesday at the train station. East Coast, okay. Can we narrow it down? I'm here in Jersey, I'm here in Boston. New York, yeah, she's from Brooklyn. Jer yeah, Boston is. Please call different. Stella. How about her? Ask her to bring these things with her from the store six spoons of fresh snow peas, five thick slabs of blue cheese, and a, maybe a snack for her brother Bob. We also need a small plastic snake and a big toy frog for the kids. She can scoop these things into three red bags and we will go meet her Wednesday at the train station. Georgia, Georgia. yes, good. Please call Stella. Ask her to bring these things with her from the store. Six spoons of fresh snow peas, five thick slabs of blue cheese, and maybe a snack for her brother Bob. We also need a small plastic snake and a big toy frog for the kids. She can scoop these things into three red bags, and we will go to meet her Wednesday at the train station. <laughs> Ireland, Scotland. How many vote for Ireland? Uh, how many vote for Scotland? It's surprising to me how bad we are at, at picking that out. It's Scottish, um, but everybody, I included, had to think about it. And I had to think, okay, where did I get this from? Um, you can actually go to this website. I don't know if you guys can see it down here. So classweb.gmu.edu/accent to look, and they've got hundreds of these things from people all over the world, so both native English speakers from different locations as well as learners of English. So you can get, and they've also got the IPA transcription of these things, so you can actually look and look at it and see how do people pronounce these things differently. So the way that we're able to, to pick out the difference between a Brooklyn accent and a Georgia accent, there's no real difference in, in the dialect, it's just the accents that differ, right? And the accents differ in the phonemes that we use. So, Brother Bob, that's sort of further forward, where I, I would say Bob, right, and hit it farther back, and it was kind of nasally. <clears throat> but for her, it's Bob. So it turns out that there are different phonemes in Brooklyn English than there are in my sort of Midwestern accent, Utah accent is what I've got. Are there different dialects of English? Yes, of course. Um, so Indian English versus American English, for example, um, or British English versus, versus American English. So they, they're going to differ both in the accents from the two, 
but there's also some dialectical differences. So dialects are mutually intelligible, but they've got different vocabulary and some different semantics, for example. So we're, what you would call pants, so I can, you know, without embarrassment, refer to pants in this class, whereas somebody in Britain, um, pants is your underwear, right? So they're talking about something kind of embarrassing. So um, when my brother served his mission in, in England, he was continually having to correct his, his greenies and say, when they were saying, oh, I've got mud on my pants, trousers. <laughs> he was continually saying, no, it's not pants, it's trousers. You don't have mud on your pants. You've got mud on your trousers. <laughs> so that he didn't embarrass himself in front of um, investigators. Hello, what's the difference in this whole class on that? And then you have people all over the dot, and they get really mad talking to us because they're like, you don't have anything like British, and so they like, don't understand. What you're <laughs> and so they get mad because it's like, wrong. Not the English they learned in their yeah. in their English classes. Yeah, yeah, it's just like me. It's not the Hungarian I learned in, in the MTC. Adrian? It's kind of strange, too, because like in South America, they learn English from England. They all have English accents mm -hmm. and speak English. It's so bizarre. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's the same way all over all over Europe, too. So everybody has a, a, a British English accent, and it's kind of entertaining. Um, <clears throat> and then they come here, and then they lose it all, and, and they start dropping their T's. So, what are, yeah, so things like mountain, curtain. Mother. Mother. Butter. Butter. Oh, yeah. Water. Water. So, yeah, those are actually kind of fun. Um, so this is, a, this is sort of the problem is that, this is the problem that Siri has quite often, is that she doesn't understand the difference between different accents, right? So Siri, if you try and have... You know, if you have an accent, particularly a Scottish accent, which is nice and you know a nice thick Scottish brogue, you have real trouble with Siri. So if you want to see something hilarious but not necessarily appropriate for class, Google some of these videos, some of these funny things about voice recognition with uh, Scottish accents. Um, Scottish comedians are actually pretty funny. Another problem is that we tend to slur things together. So that sort of mountain example. We just sort of drop some of the things, or we squish them together. Um, and even if we are pronouncing things articulately and clearly, you're still going to co-articulate phonemes. So you're going to start producing the vowel sound while you're still saying the consonant, because you can't say some of these consonants without a vowel sound, like Bs and Vs and Ms and things like that. So the idea is that you start to form the vowel sound while you're still saying the consonant. So the difference between vowel and vowel. So everybody say vowel, vowel. Notice what you're doing with your lips as you're saying vowel and vowel. While you're still saying the V sound, you, you're already shaping for the, net, for the upcoming vowel, right? So in this case, you're shaping for more of an A sound, vowel. Here you're shaping for more of an O sound, vowel. So if you look at the speech spectrograms, they're different. Even where you're saying the V, um, here, vowel, not much going on. Here, where you're saying the V, you're already saying the O. So you, it's called co-articulation. You start saying the next phoneme while you're still saying the last one. So how do you segregate these things out? How does Siri tell the difference between these things? We hear a V in both cases, right? doesn't matter to us, but the sound is very different between vowel and vowel. Also, we're pretty good at filling in for missing, um, cons or missing phonemes. I'm not sure how well Siri would do with this. I'm really curious how speech recognition um, software would do with, with this sort of setup. So the experiment is, um, well, the first condition was something like this. So the state legislators met with their respective uh, sorry, the state governors met with their respective. And here, instead of hearing the sound, the word legislators, here where there's an asterisk, there was like a cough or some other sound that obscured what, um, what the actual speech stream was. So maybe a, a scratch in the record or something like that, or a sneeze in the room, um, convening in the capital city. And then if you ask people, where did the sneeze occur, people don't actually remember or people don't actually remember that they didn't hear the, the phoneme here. You sort of fill it in based on the context, right? Here, the condition is you hear the exact same thing every time. So you hear a cough and then eel. 
So the phoneme, the first phoneme of this word is obscured in all of these cases. So you're hearing exactly the same thing, cough eel. I can't produce the cough fast enough to say the eel. All right, but they're in different contexts. So it was found that the cough eel was on the axle. It was found that the eel was on the shoe. It was found that the eel was on the orange. It was found that the eel was on the table. So all of this exactly the same, except for the context given by the last thing. And then if you ask people, what did you hear, guess what they report? Wheel, heel, peel, and near, it's ambiguous, right? Oh, meal. Meal? Okay. Yeah. So it sounds like this. I guess you, I would not have gone to meal, but then again, I'm... Not normal. Right, reading it, not hearing it. All right, so this is known as the phoneme restoration effect, that we do some filling in where we're missing things. And we talked about this sort of with vision already, right? You've got this blind spot, and your brain just does some filling in. Here, you can have blind spots in sort of analogous, blind spots in, in the auditory stream. The auditory stream is not perfect. There's all sorts of things going on. And it pays to be able to fill in this sort of stuff. So how do we actually do this filling in? We know that the filling in occurs. What's sort of helping us out? Well, one thing that helps us out for auditory perception is actual visual perception. So I'm going to show you a video. Um, actually, I'm going to play the video. What I'd like you to do is close your eyes and tell me what it sounds like he's saying. Ba, 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 ba. Okay, what does it sound like? Ba. Ba. Okay. Go ahead and open your eyes. What does it look like he's saying? Ga. So something in the back of his mouth. Ga, 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 ga. All right. Now, if you watch it and listen to it at the same time, now what do you hear? Ba, ba. Ba, ba. Ba, ba. Ba, ba. All right, now look away again. You know that he's saying... It sounds like ba if you're not looking at him. If you look at him, it sounds like da. And then if I take away the audio, then it goes back to sound looking like ga. So this is called the McGurk effect. Um, the idea is that if you have a conflict between what you're hearing and what you're seeing, you sort of take the average. So ba is made at the front of the mouth, right? With your with putting your lips together, ba 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 ba. Ga is made at the back of your mouth, ga ga ga, and da is made somewhere in between. So if there's a conflict, you sort of take the average. You say, well it looks like ga, it sounds like ba, so I must one of these must be mistaken and you you perceive him as saying da. So you can demonstrate this for yourself um, at this website. I think this is where I actually got this little video. So vision indicates ga, soundtrack says ba, and people hear something in the middle, maybe da or la. And you don't hear something that's sort of in between, right? So you don't hear something between ga and da. You never hear anything that's between ga and da. Um, because we perceive phonemes sort of categorically. So you can vary um, the difference between a P and a B, for example. So if you say P and B, what's the difference between making those two sounds? So the lip movement is exactly the same, right? P, B. It's the air. It's when you start moving the air, and specifically when you start moving your vocal cords, right? So with B, you start moving your vocal cords before you really release it. With P, you have sort of that aspiration going on, and then you start moving your vocal cords. So it's the voice onset time. So if I were to sort of graph these things out, oh, this is da and ta, same, exact same thing. So with da, you start moving your vocal cords earlier. You have a 17 millisecond delay between forming the D and, and moving your vocal cords. And with ta, it's about 90 milliseconds. So you have this difference between when you start voicing these things, when you start moving your vocal cords. So we can experimentally manipulate this difference, though. We can experimentally 
change around and sort of slide together where your voice onset time comes in. So that can change in sort of a linear fashion. So we can parametrically manipulate this. What do you think your perception is? Do you ever hear something halfway between a T and a D? So what should happen? So if I pick a, a voice onset time somewhere in the middle here, say 40 milliseconds, what are you going to hear? Sort of a weird hybrid TD combination. Turns out that you don't hear anything. Well, you hear either a T or a D, but you never really hear anything in the middle. So you have really this precipitous drop off. So this is what's known as the phonetic boundary. So you hear ta-ta-ta um, with these later voice onset times. And as you come closer, you go from hearing ta to hearing da almost immediately. So the y-axis is the probability, or the percentage of the time that people report hearing ta or da. But you don't really hear anything in the middle. So as you parametrically manipulate this, <coughs> If there was anything in the middle, you would expect a linear relationship here, right? But it's really nonlinear. You get this real drop-off between the two. So you either hear one or you hear the other one. Which is kind of handy because as you're speaking, how likely do you think that, you are to, that you're going to hit the voice onset time at exactly 17 milliseconds every time you say a D? Probably not very likely. You're going to have some variability around that. And so it helps you to perceive Ds if you can sort of recognize that. Helps you to perceive Ts if you can recognize that, oh, there's going to be some variability around T, and sort of categorize things, these things and sort of generalize them into, the, into these two perceptions. Kayla? But that's something you struggle with, like in other languages, like not knowing the boundary between the terms. Yes. So then we can't even tell like what. Okay. Right, exactly. So there's a difference between R's and L's in, in English, right? So the difference is where you hit your tongue on the, on the top of your mouth. But if you lack R's and L's in your language, say in Japanese, for example, you can't tell that difference, right? And so if you wanted to pretend you have a Japanese accent, well, you just mix up your R's and L's, right? Because they don't really distinguish between those things. For them, it's all the same. There's no phonetic boundary um, for a native Japanese speaker. But for English speakers, we do hear these things. And it turns out that this is acquired. So um, infants, newborn infants, can tell the difference between all phonemes and all spoken languages. But after about six months or so, you start to show a preference for your, um, for the spoken language that you hear around you, that you get exposure to. Um, and then after adolescence, you can't tell the difference between these things, basically. Or it's very, very difficult for you to tell the difference between these things. So if you pick up a language by about age seven or so, then you can still hear these differences um, that don't exist in your language, but it get, becomes more difficult as you move into adolescence. So there's a, there's a critical window for these things. Um, one other thing I wanted to say about the McGurk effect that I sort of forgot um, is that if you, if you have a face-to-face -face conversation with someone and then have a phone conversation with that person, it's actually easier to understand them than if you've never seen that person speak before. And this is sort of the McGurk effect in action. So if you've spoken to someone, and then you talk to them on the phone, you can actually understand them better um, if, the, if the speech sound is, or if the speech term is, is a little bit ambiguous. Why do you think that might be? How does the McGurk effect play into that? They kind of find your ability to interpret phonemes just because you've seen them. Right, exactly. So you hear it, and you can actually mentally generate a, an image. So remember when we were talking about imagery last week? You can imagine what they look like when they're saying that, and that actually helps you in understanding what they are, in fact, saying. So the McGurk effect doesn't necessarily need the actual visual stimulus to be there. You can actually imagine people, and it actually helps you out with, um, with understanding people. Okay. I think that's not like knowing their nonverbal cues better. You know how some people, or like how, what they usually say. Um, because the you can have very very short conversations with people, so maybe a five minute conversation with someone, so not enough time for you to get sort of all their nonverbal stuff. All right, that's it for today. You're not sure what you did before.